I want to tell you this morning, we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. We already know who's won. We already know the end of the book. The battle is over. Jesus said it is finished. The battle is won. We are more than conquerors. We are fighting from victory. We have a hope today in Christ. We're going to read one verse this morning. It's verse 14 in Galatians chapter 6. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a light that penetrates the darkness today. There is a light, and that light shines from Calvary and from the cross. I want to talk to you this morning on the triumph of the cross. The triumph of the cross First, we need to remember that the plan of salvation was finished at Calvary. The plan that God had put into effect from before the beginning of the world was completed and it was finished at Calvary. Now this is exciting. This should be to you. This is when Genesis chapter 3, 15, you remember when Adam and Eve had fallen and God had come and God had seen them in their sin and in their nakedness and God slew an innocent animal and shed the blood of that animal and poured it out uh, and sacrificed uh, and God took and made a covering for their sin, a covering for their nakedness. He made them clothes, uh, but He shed the blood of the innocent animal. And then in Genesis 3, 15, He says the seed of the woman is coming and He will be victorious and you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. And from that moment on, the plan of salvation was in effect, uh, and it began to work. Uh, how many times did Satan try to stop it? How many times did he come and try to subvert the plan? You know, after God chose the Jewish people through Abraham to bring Jesus into the world, the Messiah the virgin-born Son of God. After the plan was clear, Satan came and he attempted to destroy the Jews in Egypt. He oppressed them. He burdened them. He brought death to them. He executed the children. And there, they were being slain in Egypt. But God lifted them up and God delivered them, and by the mighty hand of God, they were delivered. What about David? David was the one through whom the Messiah would come. David, he would, the Messiah would be called what? The son of David. He would be of the house and the lineage of David. So guess what Satan did? He hired an assassin. Didn't really hire him, but in a way he did. And he brought Goliath of Gath, one of the sons of Anak. Goliath was a monster, you can read it. He had six fingers and six toes. Go back and read the story. He was six cubits and a span. And in earthly terms, you could say his number was 666. He was Hale's assassin. He was come to destroy David from whom the Messiah would come. But I want to tell you, 
David walked down the hill and he said, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God, Jehovah, and God will deliver you into my hand. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Haman plotted to destroy the Jews in Persia. You know the story. He, he devised a plan where on a certain day, every Jew in the kingdom would be slain. But God had a secret agent. Did you know God's got secret agents all over the place? I mean, and, and you don't have to sing secret agent man because God's got, he's got them embedded in places where you never dreamed and God had preordained and prearranged and God had prepared a young lady to be at the right place at the right time to deliver Israel. And when Mordecai said, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this, and God delivered them. And Haman was hung on his own gallows. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And Herod killed all the children who were born there two years old and under. He tried to stop the Messiah. When Jesus told his disciples he was going to the cross and he would be crucified, Peter said, oh, no, you're not. No, you're not. Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. I have a plan and a purpose. Jesus in Gethsemane had a human moment. And there he knelt and he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But then God spoke to him and he said, Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. I will drink the cup. I will go to the cross. And I want to tell you, because Satan could not pervert, he could not stop we have the cross today and we have hope. J Jesus was the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. The Bible says Him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin became sin for you and I. The sins of the whole world were laid upon Christ in Isaiah 53 and 6. You know that verse. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone into his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Upon Christ, the sin of the world was laid upon his back. And him who knew no sin became sin for us. Isaiah 53 and 5 describes it. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes we are healed. He was wounded. He was bruised. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. In Isaiah 53 and 7, He says He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He went forth and he opened not his mouth. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ is that Lamb. And Jesus Christ came. He said, For this cause was I born, and for this cause I came into the world. What was that cause? To give his life as a ransom for many. I want to tell you at 3 o'clock on that Friday afternoon, when Jesus lifted his eyes to heaven and he said, it is finished. Oh, it rang out 
not just through the Judean hills, but it rang throughout the world, throughout the heavens, throughout the universe. And the angel sang because he said, it is finished. The battle is over. The price has been paid. And now the power of sin is broken and the bondage of sin is gone and we're free because Jesus paid it all at Calvary. Amen. Praise the Lord. Number two, the Satan was defeated at the cross. His power was broken. The power of sin was broken. Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. They overcame him. How? By their talent, their abilities, by their strength? No, they overcame who? Satan. How? By the blood of the Lamb of God. Who overcame him? The church, the blood-bought, the redeemed, those who were washed in the blood of the Lamb. They overcame evil and Satan by the blood of the Lamb. Praise the Lord. Wow, I don't know if this is exciting to you, but I think back in Egypt. I think back in Egypt at the first Passover. And that Passover was simply symbolic of the true Passover that one day would come. And God said, put the blood on the doorpost of your home. And then he said, the death angel is coming But then he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and you will be protected from death, from evil, and I will cover you. And now we can sing that song, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, I want to tell you, we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Satan is a defeated foe. Romans says we are more than conqueror through Christ. I want to tell you this morning, we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. We already know who's won. We already know the end of the book. The battle is over. Jesus said it is finished. The battle is won. We are more than conquerors. We are fighting from victory. We have a hope today. In Christ. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. He speaks of Jesus having disarmed the enemy and made a public spectacle of Satan. He's disarmed him, he's made a show of him publicly. He is He has destroyed the power of Satan and Jesus has the keys of death, hell, and the grave and He is victor. Oh, I don't know about you, but when somebody takes your keys, somebody takes the keys to your car, means you can't drive it anymore. It means now they have authority and they drive it and they're in charge. When somebody takes all the keys to your house, it means you can't get in unless they let you in. And Jesus has the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and he is victor, and he is the risen Lord, and Satan is defeated. Amen. I want to tell you, I've read the end of the book. Satan will be cast into a lake of fire forever and ever and ever. When Satan comes and he wants to remind you of your past, you just remind him of his future. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, Jesus, that I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there ye may be also. I want to tell you, there is a place prepared for us And it is beyond anything we have imagined. And the power of Satan has been defeated. Thirdly, because of the cross, I have the peace of God. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. 
not as the world gives. But he said, I give a peace that the world cannot understand. Folks, that is your inheritance. Jesus said, I am leaving this for you, for my children. It's something the world can't know, they can't understand. Paul calls it a peace that passeth all human understanding. Oh, I want to tell you, Jesus said, I'm giving it to you. When troubles come, when the battles come, when the giants come, when the enemy says you can't win, you can have a peace that is beyond all human understanding. Amen. Colossians 1.20, chapter 1, verse 20 says, Christ has made peace through the cross. What do you think that means? Christ made peace through the cross. How in the world did, wait a minute. That wasn't very peaceful. In fact, it was really unpeaceful. But how did Jesus make peace at the cross? Well, I want to tell you what he did at the cross. Sin had separated God and man. And we could not enter into the presence of a holy God. And we were enemies of God, the Bible says. But when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he shed his blood and he paid the price for all of our sin, Jesus reached up and he took God by the hand and he reached down and he took mankind by the hand and he brought those two hands and he put them together on his chest and he said now there is peace between God and man because sin has been paid for in full totally forever and we never have to pay the price again. He made peace through the blood of the cross and now we can have peace in the midst of the storm. I meet people every day who are looking for peace. They're struggling. They're fighting. They're trying to get ahead in business. They're getting every toy, every new car, the lake house. They're trying to find something to satisfy them, something to give them a peace, and nothing seems to work. You see, there's a God-shaped hole in every heart. You're a spiritual being. You were created in the image of God. You are a spiritual, there is a spirit within you, and you can never satisfy a spirit with earthly things. Amen. Only heavenly things can satisfy the spirit. And I don't care how hard you try, there will always be an emptiness and a longing in your heart and you will never satisfy that longing within you because you were created for fellowship with God. I want to tell you, nothing in this world will ever satisfy that longing in your soul until you meet Jesus Christ and surrender your life to Him. Fourthly, at three o'clock on that Friday afternoon, Jesus called out with a loud voice, It is finished. It is finished. The price has been paid. The battle is over. And when Jesus called out across the valley and yelled, It is finished. Suddenly in the temple, that massive curtain, that massive veil that hung 60 feet, somebody grabbed it in the center at the top and tore it in half and slung it back and the veil was rent in two. And I want to tell you now, we have calling unto us the voice of God, saying, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, come, and I will give you rest. Amen. Amen. That veil had hung there. It said no admittance. 
It separated God from man. Nobody but the high priest could enter only once a year. It said you cannot come into the presence. Sin can never enter into the presence of God. You can't come. Stay away. I tried to visit the White House several years ago. My only real visit to Washington. Guess what? I didn't get real close. They said I couldn't go in and they didn't have any tours. And that was before sequestration too. I had to stand a long way off and look at the White House. And you know what? Before the cross, we had to stand a long way back. And we had to look. But I want to tell you, when Jesus cried, it is finished. God reached up and He tore that veil. And Hebrews says, let us now come boldly unto a throne of grace where we can find help in the day of trouble. Amen. We have a new covenant. We have a new way. Now the cry of the Bible has come. Now the Bible says, Whosoever will, let him come. Now Jesus is shown knocking at the door. Knocking at the door. He says, Behold, I knock. If anybody will open, I will come in and sup with him. You don't need a saint. You don't need a priest. You don't need the Virgin Mary. You don't need a, somebody to go in your place. Now you are invited to enter into the presence of God yourself. Oh, wow, this is, ex, this is exciting, isn't it? Wow. There's hope at the cross. The cross is the core, the centerpiece of our hope. The cross is the centerpiece. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, speaks of this hope that we have as an anchor of our soul. What hope? That our sins are forgiven. That through the cross of Jesus Christ, we can come and we can have forgiveness and we can know sins forgiven. Jesus paid it all, not some. Jesus paid the price once and for all. There is therefore now no need for sacrifice for sins because Jesus paid it all. I don't have to worry about how good I can be. I don't have to try to keep 98 rules and hope that I don't mess up. Because now I come in the blood of Jesus. And when God looks, He doesn't see me. He sees Jesus Christ. He sees me covered in the blood of the Lamb. And He says, come on home, my child. You're washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, I want to tell you, there's hope today at the cross. There's hope. There's hope today because we have an anchor that holds. We have hope in God. We can hope that even though we mess up and even though we fail and even though we falter, we can come and know that there is forgiveness. And lastly, at the cross, we see that God loves us. We see His love in a real, tangible way, a way that's demonstrated. Jesus didn't just love us in word. Jesus didn't just say, I want to send you a letter and tell you I love you. How many times do we tell people, I love you? We just tell people casually, I love you. But the Bible says greater love has no man than this, that he give his life for a friend. Jesus didn't just casually say it, I love you. Jesus didn't just say, oh, I want you to know I care about you and I'm going to be there for you. But Jesus came and he gave his life. In John 3, 16, says it so well. For God so loved the world 
that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Lamb of God came to die in your place. It was the greatest exchange of history. You see, Jesus took your punishment and He gave you freedom. Jesus took your poverty and He gave you riches. Jesus took your disease and He gave you healing. He took your death and gave you His life. He took your despair and gave you His hope. He took your anxiety and He gave you the peace of God that's beyond understanding. I want to tell you, every time, every time that Roman soldier struck that nail, every time he reared back and he hit that nail and it rang out throughout the hillsides, uh, it was ringing out, I love you. I love you. I love you. And they couldn't understand it. They, they thought they were destroying Christ and everything He stood for. And they didn't realize uh, that He was becoming victor. He was overcoming. Uh, that love would overcome darkness. That love would overcome evil. That love would triumph through the cross because God loved you so much. There's a God that loves you more than you'll ever understand. Folks, I don't know what you're going through and I don't know what you're battling with, but I want to tell you there is a God that loves you more than you can even grasp with your finite mind. It was love that held Jesus on the cross. Love held Him there. Oh, I, I, I read last night, just, I just reread. I wanted to read the different Gospels and the crucifixion. I read the, the different stories. I read about the ones mocking him. I read about even the soldiers mocked him. Even the thieves on each side mocked him. I mean, they, they, they stood at the chief priest said, Hey, if you're really the Son of God, why don't you come down off the cross and then we'll all believe? Come on down, we'll believe. And they said he saved others himself he cannot save. That was the truth. That was prophecy. He saved others himself he could not save. They laughed at him. They mocked him. Don't you know every fiber of his being wanted to come down from that cross? And he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. But love held him on the cross because he was thinking of you and he saw your face and he saw your family and he saw your hurt and he saw your need and love is what held him on the cross.